on the web webinar who are at various stages of the career of their careers. So I've tried to achieve a balance with regard to the level of information on the slide. Um, please note that we will have time at the end of the talk for questions, um, and I may attempt to field a few of your questions throughout the talk. Uh, so feel, please feel free to use the questions box on your screen. Um, and we also welcome you to submit feedback after the webinar to let us know what bits you found more useful or less useful, uh, what you would have liked to hear more about, and perhaps topics you would like to see covered in future webinars. So to start off, um, just to give you an idea of what I'll try to cover today, I'll just start with a brief history of the Lancet Group and give you an overview of the Lancet Journal and um, provide some information about useful, again, realizing that some of you are, of course, already well-versed in preparing and submitting manuscripts. Um, then I'll tell you a little bit of sort of insider information about how we handle manuscripts from the time that you submit them all the way through the end of the process. And then lastly, um, I'd like to give you a little bit more information about my own journal, The Lancet Rheumatology, and also some general considerations when you're submitting papers to newly launched journals. So we'd like to think of authors sort of going on a journey with us when you submit your work. And so that's sort of how I aim to present my talk today. Um, but before we get into the details of that, just a little bit of history for you on the Lancet Group. So this is what the Lancet portfolio of journals looks like today. We have 18 different titles, the newest of which are the Lancet Rheumatology and the Lancet Digital Health, shown down in the front of the group of journals. The main Lancet itself was founded back in 1823, and the Lancet was the sole journal almost for 200 years. But starting in 2000, the group began to expand, first with the Lancet Oncology, and then, as you can see from the timeline, the group has expanded steadily since that time. So included in the Lancet portfolio of journals are six gold open access journals here. Um, and you can see that hopefully read the titles that are shown here. Um, but I would also add that for all of the work we publish, we're really committed to supporting authors and making the research publicly and freely available. So authors are encouraged to post their accepted and unedited articles on personal institutional websites anytime after publication, in print or online. And really all we ask if you do that is to indicate the citation and a link to the final published article on thelancet.com. So that's what our group of journals looks like. Um, in terms of who we are as um, staff of the Lancet Group, so the Lancet Group comprises roughly 150 full-time employees. Our main hub is in London, and this is where most of our editors are based. Um, our editors come from a wide variety of specialties and have medical or scientific training, or often both. London is also the home to our production team, our assistant editor team, electronic production, marketing and communications, and also our journal support team. Um, we also have offices in Beijing and offices in New York, where um, we have members of the editorial team, uh, as is shown here, and also some members of marketing and communications um, who are dedicated to um, marketing in China. So obviously, uh, we as editors of the Lancet Journal think that you should publish your work with us. So why do we think you should publish your work with us? Um, so shown here are some of those reasons. So in short, we're really committed to publishing the best science, science that adheres to the highest standard of scientific and ethical principles, and really offers the opportunity to improve lives of patients across the globe. So these might sort of sound, sound like standard talking points, but I can really assure you that this is something that all of the editors and team members at the Lancet genuinely embrace, and that guides our editorial decisions. Just with regard to publication ethics, um, we're longstanding members of the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors and the Committee on Publication Efforts. Um, and we have a real global community of authors um, that are obviously integral to our mission of delivering impactful global health and clinical, meaningful clinical medical research. Um, 
And those authors share our commitment to the right to health, health equity, and social justice. Um, so as I've just outlined to you, we're a truly global group of editors and professionals. And our aim, in the end, is to just provide you with the best possible service um, in dealing with your manuscript and to help maximize the accuracy, accessibility, and impact of your research, um, and hopefully to bring your work to millions of readers around the world. So on a sort of more individual level, what we offer you as an author um, is what is shown here. Um, so simply put, we aim to offer you a great service. Um, and one thing I really hope to convey throughout this talk um, is that we as editors are here for you. So this whole process of publishing research is about your work and your research. And our job as editors is to essentially shepherd that work through the submission, peer review, and publication process. Um, so to that end, um, we, again, we have a uniquely integrated multi-specialty editorial team. We aim to offer an incomparable editorial service. Um, and part of that service is transparent and open communication with you as authors um, throughout the stages of the journey of your manuscript. And so what that means um, really is that our lines of communication should always be open to you. Um, so at any point, if you have a manuscript under peer review or at any stage of, of the process, um, you should feel free to contact the appropriate editor. Our email addresses are readily discoverable on the various journal websites. Um, and so we really want to make sure that you know um, that you're welcome to contact us at any time. We offer first-rate expert peer review um, and, again, unparalleled global research and impact. Um, and the other thing that I wanted to point out before moving on is that uh, a lot of different people are going to look at your paper at the Lancet Group. Um, it's a very collaborative process, and it's really typical for papers to have literally 20 pair of eyes looking at them um, by the end of the process. So now I've told you a bit more about who we are as a group and a group of journals. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about the content that we publish um, and what we're looking for in that content. So in terms of the types of articles that we publish, um, these include the following. Uh, editorials and comments, so each journal publishes editorials with every issue. Um, these are really the voice of each journal, written by the editors, uh, with the aim of raising awareness of particular clinical topics, global health to topics. We also, also publish comments, which are generally written by experts in the field. Every research article that we publish in most of our Lancet journals are accompanied by expert commentary. Many of the journals also have correspondence sections world report and news sections, and also perspectives, and of course, research articles. Um, and then lastly, what we uh, call our green section, and this includes um, review articles, narrative reviews, systematic reviews, seminars, review series, health policy pieces, etc. Uh, in terms of um, research articles specifically, uh, in, in past iterations of this webinar or a similar webinar, there's been a lot of um, questions about which types of studies that we consider and which types of studies that we prioritize. Um, so um, we certainly do prioritize certain types of studies over others. Uh, not surprisingly, as clinical journals, among our highest priorities are randomized and interventional trials, um, large meta-analyses, and large prospective cohort studies. Uh, somewhat lower priority would be retrospective and post-talk studies. We also do occasionally publish qualitative research, although relatively rarely. And case theories and, and clinical case reports um, are also fairly rare uh, for us to publish. Um, what we don't consider, and, and there have been questions about this in the past, um, trial protocols is something that the left that used to publish that we no longer do. And we also don't publish purely methodological studies. And so um, although these priorities are generally consistent across all of the Lancet journals, um, we do, of course, realize that each field is unique and certain article types might be more um, important for certain fields. Uh, since I'm the editor of a rheumatology journal, I'll use rheumatology as an example. 
And one thing about rheumatology as a field is that uh, the diseases, rheumatic diseases, are extremely heterogeneous. Um, but we don't have a very in-depth understanding of that heterogeneity comparable to, say, oncology. And because of this, the Lancet Rheumatology would probably be more likely to, than other, some other Lancet titles to be interested in, say, post hoc analyses of clinical trials um, and also in clinical proximal translational studies that might help to illuminate the heterogeneity of disease. Um, and also, as a general rule, uh, although I'm showing you this list of sort of high priorities and lower priorities, I would say that if you feel that you have a study that might be of interest to one of the Lancet journals, but maybe you're not entirely sure whether it fits into our scope, um, you should certainly feel free to reach out to in the pre-submission inquiry. And, uh, feedback prior to going through the submission process. So in general, when we're looking at clinical research, um, what do we look for? So on the positive side, uh, generally what we discuss when we're looking at new submissions is the novelty of the question being asked by the study and of course the clinical importance of that question. Um, we would we prefer to see studies that uh, have the potential to influence clinical practice, um, studies that are more generalizable, for example, you know, studies that uh, can be broadly generalized to larger populations, so maybe aren't very clinically, regionally limited, uh, results that challenge dogma or clinical convention. Of course, we're always looking for robust trial design and methodology. Um, <clears throat> and I also want to say, in terms of um, clinical trials, there's uh, a, a sort of <laughs> long-standing thought in the field that it's very difficult to publish negative studies. Um, but I do want to point out that we're very open to considering negative trials, and we do appreciate that some negative trials are certainly very important clinically. Um, and then particularly, I would say, for my journal, studies that reveal fundamental new understanding of disease mechanisms and patient heterogeneity, as I just mentioned. Um, and I'll just pause here. Um, very quickly, because a question has popped up from one of the listeners um, who wants to know about correspondence and whether these are commissioned. Um, they are not commissioned. We got correspondence uh, submissions on a variety of topics. It can be on something um, simply related to the topic of the journal, or it can be in direct reference to a paper that we've published. Um, so we certainly consider unsolicited correspondence. Um, and then moving on. So these are some of the things that we look for in papers. So what do we look out for? So some of the things that maybe um, wouldn't, we would not want to see in a research uh, paper. So um, a poorly selected question, obviously, uh, is a negative um, and or an inappropriate uh, patient group or clinical endpoint in a trial. Um, that said, it's not always, it's not always clear that your question and or your patient group maybe were suboptimal until the trial is underway or completed. Um, we prefer trials that have comparative groups. Uh, an underpowered trial uh, is a negative. So for example, a trial that um, has had difficulty enrolling or simply has too few participants for the results to be conclusive. An over-reliance on ad hoc or exploratory analyses that particularly when it overshadows the, the primary endpoint of the study. Um, for studies looking at predictive tools uh, or biomarkers of response, for example, um, we like to see these validated in independent cohorts. So lack of val validation is often um, something that we consider when we're looking at these papers. For clinical trials, um, we require a, a protocol, a registered protocol. Um, we typically will not send a paper to review without a protocol. Um, and in trials, uh, one of the things that we don't necessarily like to see is, is a huge um, stress on unplanned post-talk analyses, certainly ones that aren't um, indicated as such, and the lack of trial registration. And the last thing I'll mention is just sort of the <laughs> issue of what we call salami slicing or me-too papers. Um, and that is 
the practices for the dividing of the body of research into segments that, on their own, um, are probably too small to constitute a meaningful um, and novel advance in the field. So when you're thinking about submitting your paper for publication, um, the first thing to do really is to look at the journal's information for authors and to familiarize yourself about the journal's scope, its policies, its procedures. Um, I'm showing you here, uh, you can see the URL on the screen for the Lancet uh, Preparing Your Manuscript site. Um, and on this, you will find a pre-submission checklist that's really helpful when you're submitting papers. Um, and then, of course, when you choose your journal, you want to go to that journal's information for authors and look at the policies. So now I want to just move on to sharing with you some tips um, for preparing your paper um, and really a sort of section by section do's and don'ts um, covering all of the sections of the paper. So starting off um, with the covering letter. Uh, now, tips for writing a covering letter will undoubtedly vary depending on which editor you're talking to. Um, so what I've tried to do here is to fill some guiding principles that I think are general, generalizable across journals. Uh, and the first thing I would say, this is just an example of one that's probably too brief. So the first thing that I would say um, that we really want to know in a cover letter is if you've already discussed your research or your trial with a specific editor, and certainly if that editor encouraged you to submit the work. We also want to know if your submission is in direct response to a call for papers, which we often publish. Um, if you're submitting a paper to the Lancet, the main Lancet, it's also common that you might have spoken to an editor, not of the Lancet itself, but one of the specialty journals. And if so, letting us know in the covering letter will prompt a conversation among the editors. Um, and it's also really likely to help put your work in the proper context of the field um, by way of discussion amongst the, the different editors. It's also really important to let us know if you're presenting the data at an upcoming, upcoming conference or if the findings are relevant to an impending government or regulated decision. If you're presenting your data at an upcoming conference, and provided there's enough time for the papers to make its way through the peer review and publication process, um, we are always happy to coordinate the timing of publication with a particular meeting and even an exact session that you're speaking in. In terms of the science and research itself, we want a fairly brief description of the findings and how it fits into the field and why it's important to the field. But really, I think this can be done in two or three sentences. Um, my personal opinion is that you should save your energy for the paper itself. We will read your paper. We'll read it in full. Um, so we really only want to brief this with descriptions and cover letters. And the last thing that's important to put in your cover letter is if you prefer um, certain individuals to be excluded from the peer review process, um, you are more than happy to request such exclusions uh, with a brief reason for why you're requesting these exclusions. Um, with ideally a maximum of three to four people that you'd like to exclude from the field. So, on the flip side, some things to avoid doing in a covering letter. Um, one thing is just putting the abstract in full. We see this quite a lot. It's unnecessary. Um, secondly, it's best not to oversell the importance of the research or the clinical impact of the findings. Again, we will read the paper in full. Um, so there's no need to oversell it in cover letters. As I've just mentioned, try not to request too many peer review exclusions. Um, and lastly, again, this is really perfect. personal preference, but it's really typically necessary to write more than the paper in the cover letter. And again, focus your energy on the paper itself. But equally, um, make sure that the arguments for the study, the study's relevance are not made only in the covering letter. Make sure that those arguments are made here in the paper. So moving on to the paper itself, of course, um, the first thing you want to look at is the title. Um, now, much of the information I'll go through as we uh, look at section by section um, will particularly re relate to clinical trials. Um, but of course, it's important to familiar yourself, familiarize yourself with whatever reporting guidelines um, for the type of study you've done. 
So the title. The title is the first thing the reader sees, so it should provide a really accurate description of your work. Um, if it doesn't, the people who you most want to read your work might not read it, and by extension, you might be less likely to cite it when reporting your own work. Um, we see a surprising number of suboptimal titles and even inaccurate titles. Um, so the four, four components here are what we think makes a good title. Firstly, keep it succinct. Secondly, describe the key content, so tell us what topic the study covers. Um, use a descriptive and non-declamatory title rather than direct statement of the finding. And the last thing that's important is to include a uh, trial descriptive and also avoid obscure abbreviations. That's also quite important. Um, so just to give you a glimpse of a few titles from the Lancet Rheumatology, um, I've tried to pick a variety of different study designs to show you. Um, and this is just to illustrate what a title should look like. This is not necessarily what these titles looked like when the papers were originally submitted. But you can see they all include a clear and descriptive phrase indicating the topic of the work, um, usually followed by a colon, and a description of the study design. So in the top left, um, this is a typical randomized controlled trial. Often you'll see the name of the trial included there, Tula Fun. Below that is a genome-wide association study, looking at IgG4-related disease. Um, in the lower right is a prospective validation study, um, looking at a particular end, clinical endpoint of disease activity in patients with lupus. So this is really what your uh, title should look like. So moving on to the abstract, and I would say the title and the abstract um, are really very, very important. These are the most discoverable publicly discoverable parts of your paper. This is what comes up, obviously, in search engine um, and investing sites. Um, this slide is really just to remind me, to remind you, to follow the appropriate reporting standards. Um, so, for example, consort for randomized trials. And just to mention that all of these um, guidelines include specific instructions for uh, letting you so, looking at the abstract in more detail, I'm going to show you an example here of a typical clinical trial abstract, um, which of course includes four parts, um, the background, the method, the findings, and the interpretation. So looking at this section by section, so firstly the background, and what should be included here is a statement about why the question that you are asking is important a summary of the wider context of the work, and a brief description of the aim of the study. Um, you'd be really surprised at how many papers come in with abstracts that actually don't tell you what the study is aimed to do. Next is the method section. Um, here, uh, and this again, this is primarily for clinical trials, and so what we need to know here is the sample size, the location, the time frame of the study, so when you started enrolling patients and finished enrolling patients, the basic inclusion and exclusion criteria of patients who are enrolled in the study. We want to know what interventions are given if you're given a drug, what dose of the drug, at what schedule. In terms of outcomes, uh, typically the abstract should only include the primary outcome of the study and how it was measured. Uh, how you did the analysis, uh, again, a brief description of the main statistical test that you use to look at your outcome. And finally, uh, all trials should certainly have the trial registry number included in that. So moving on to the findings. The findings should always include the number of patients analyzed, which is often uh, omitted from abstract analysis. Uh, the results of the primary outcome of the trial, again, as a general rule, secondary outcomes shouldn't be included in this track. Um, this is not a hard and fast rule with Lancet Journals, you will see exceptions to this, but by and large, we want you to focus on the primary outcome. The, the abstract finding section should also include uh, adverse events in the clinical trial. And importantly, this section is just for results in the and the interpretation of what comes at the end. Um, this should be quite short and sweet and also objective. Don't 
in or oversell the findings, and simply tell us in a brief sentence or two what the findings mean for clinical practice, and possibly what needs to happen next um, in terms of another clinical trial, a larger clinical trial, or what questions need to be answered for the, the study to have some sort of impact. Returning to the introduction, uh, the introduction is used to provide context for your manuscript and to convince the reader why your work advances the field of study. So the most important aspects, as you can see here, of the introduction is to indicate where the field stands, what problem you're addressing, and what is the aim of the current study. Now, it's important to be concise in the introduction, but if you also have to remember to give the reader enough information to really understand why the work is important and to introduce the main scientific publications on which your work is based. So it's important to make sure to cite the key studies that inform the current work and, again, give the reader a sense of how your work fits into the literature. Make sure you clearly address at the end of the, end of the introduction what is the problem you're ultimately trying to solve, why is the study needed, and what is the aim. Some quick tips in terms of writing the introduction itself. Again, what we want to see is a thorough but brief summary of the state of the field. Make sure you clearly outline where the knowledge gaps are. And again, at the end of the introduction in the final paragraph, summarize the study design and the primary outcome of the study. Now, what we don't want to see is we don't, certainly don't want you to admit, omit relevant publications or studies, even those that might have come to similar findings as you have or opposite findings, and even if those studies were published after you started yours. We also don't want to see uh, a thorough summary of the findings, because that is um, best left for the results section. So moving on now to the methods. The methods section is extremely important, as you all know. Um, as you're well aware, uh, the expectation here is to, for the reader to be given sufficient detail to allow them to repeat the work that you've done. So here, the method section is one where I would say detail is more important than brevity. So, of course, we do prefer that you adhere to link limits when submitting a paper. We are flexible. And the methods is one place where we would prefer you to be more detailed rather than less. If later on, if there are bits of the methods that we think can be omitted or moved into an appendix, this can be addressed in a later stage. So again, um, if you look at the bullet points outlined on the slide, we want you to be clear and provide enough detail. Indicate the type of study it is. Indicate if you're uh, following guidelines for reporting, so depending on the type of study you're, you're doing. What study population you're investigating, if you're doing um, a drug trial, what uh, patient population and what the key inclusion and exclusion criteria are. Of course, if this is a uh, randomized patient trial, then we need to see ethical approval and patient consent statement. Of course, we need to understand uh, if you're doing a drug trial, what that drug is, how you're giving it, and on what schedule, and equally what your methods of observation are, how often you're following up patients, and what you're testing during each follow-up session. The methods also needs to include a clear and complete list of outcome measures, starting with the primary outcome, how the outcomes are defined, and the methods of assessment. The statistical analysis is also extremely important in this section. Again, uh, should be detailed enough for someone to reproduce those statistics and come up with the same results. And lastly, indicate the role of the funding source, if there is one. Moving on to the results section, uh, just to give a few do's and don'ts for the results. So first of all, it's important to very clearly report the primary outcome of the study and whether or not that outcome was met. When you're presenting data, uh, indicate, give an indication of the precision of the data. So for example, for, inter, for medians, give an interquartile range. Um, for survival data, 95% confidence intervals. And again, as mentioned before, if you're reporting a trial, it's very important that the trial be reported as it was specified in the protocol. And this should be very clearly, we should indicate this very clearly in the results. 
when giving numbers, so if you're reporting percentages of a patient population that achieved a particular outcome, we want to see the actual numbers, so the number of patients over the total, along with the percentage. And lastly, it's important to very clearly indicate if any of the analyses you've done were post hoc or exploratory. A few things that we want to look out for when writing the results section. So we don't want to see you reiterate every single number that's presented in the tables and the figures. It's perfectly fine to summarize those data. You can give key data uh, for the primary outcome, for example, but we don't want to see an entire list of all of the numbers in the tables and figures. Um, we prefer that you avoid subjective terms, uh, substantially, dramatically, things like this. We prefer that the data speak for themselves. Um, similarly, the word significant should really only be used to indicate statistical significance. It shouldn't be used in a non-statistical context. Um, again, uh, don't put too much emphasis on exploratory or post hoc, hoc outcomes, and these certainly shouldn't overshadow the primary outcome of the analysis. And lastly, in the results section, we don't expect to see an interpretation of the data. Here, we really just want to know what the data are and the interpretation can come in the discussion section. So moving on to the discussion. The discussion is where you're given an opportunity to tell the reader what the results mean, how the results fit into the context of the field. So first of all, it's really important that the, dis the discussion correspond to the results and not go far beyond what the data are actually saying. It's important here also to compare your results with those that have been published previously, and to discuss why maybe you've had different results or similar results from other studies. Another very important part of the discussion are the limitations. Uh, we want to hear a, a clear discussion of, of what the limitations of the trial were, or study of any kind, what the limitations were, um, and what maybe needs to be done in the future to address those limitations, whether it's in a further trial or additional studies. So now that we've gone through all of the depth sections of a manuscript, I want to just revisit briefly trial registration. So at The Lancet, we require that all interventional trials be registered prospectively, so before the trial begins. And we ask for this for several reasons. Um, one of them is to promote transparency in the reporting. It encourages the reporting of all trials and actually identifies whether there's a need for that trial to be done. Um, it's really important here um, to allow any protocol amendments that might have been made to be seen. And it's also important, I should say, to point out whether there's protocol amendments uh, when you're writing the paper that will belong in the methods section um, and why those amendments were made. And then lastly, the registration, trial registration databases uh, are publicly available resources for both, resource for both patients and doctors. So some general tips, again, going back to preparing your manuscript. Preparing your manuscript. Again, um, I'd like to reiterate the importance of the title and abstract. Um, this is the most visible aspect of your paper. Um, you should think about your paper as a story, you're telling a story, um, so do so as simply and concisely as possible, um, but remember not to skimp on important details. Um, make sure you're communicating your story in a logical way. Um, try to avoid jargon as much as possible. Of course, we appreciate that specialty jargon is not always avoidable, so when it's not avoidable, you should make sure to, to define the terms that you're using um, for non-specialist readers. It's always really useful if you can ask colleagues outside your specialty to read your paper before you submit it. Um, if your colleagues find the paper confusing or unclear in any way, it's likely that people who read your paper will also find it confusing or unclear. Um, and one of my biggest tips for communicating your work effectively is really just to use simple language. Um, so more complicated words often detract more than they ask. So, um, just to show you some of my favorite examples, um, often when people just want to say that they use a technique, they like to say utilize, or they like to say employ, 
um, and something that I used to encounter very often when I was editing uh, basic uh, research journal was the use of the word interrogate when you mean screen or test. Um, not in position, we're not interrogating anyone. Um, so really important to keep the language simple. Um, another suggestion that I would just throw in is if you have the time and inclination, um, it's really quite useful to explore uh, the literature on writing itself. I'm showing you here a few examples, um, two of which were, are from a really terrific writer and former colleague um, published in the journal Cell Biology, and these are explorations um, of how to write effective scientific papers specifically. Um, I would also uh, direct you to two really classic guides to writing that I think everyone should read and reread. Um, one is On Writing Well by William Zinsser, and one is The Elements of Style by Strunk and White. Um, these are really my personal suggestions. This is in no way um, a lancet specific um, suggestion, but I do think that if you have the time, um, it's really useful to look at some of these resources. So now that you've crafted your terrific, outstanding scientific article, you need to figure out where to submit it. Well, chances are that you've already chosen or at least discussed the target journal with your co-authors. Um, possibly before you even started writing the paper. Um, but you might also be considering multi multiple journals depending on the topic of the research. Um, so this is really just to remind you um, to, uh, about some of the resources we offer on thelancet.com. Um, we have direct links to each of the journals um, on thelancet.com that uh, direct you to the scope guide uh, information for authors and submission information for each of our journals. And if you're considering a Lancet journal, you can also find, um, also on the Lancet.com, direct links to all of our journals. Um, simply select the journal you want to submit, click Submit, um, and you will be taken to the appropriate submission site. Um, you can also submit directly from each journal's homepage. Um, so it's really helpful to familiarize yourself with the journal. So, with Lancet journals, if your research isn't accepted by the first journal that you submit to, you might be eligible for your paper to be transferred to another Lancet journal. So this is another reason that it's really good to familiarize yourself um, with the entire portfolio of our journal. And then when you're ready to submit, I'm sorry. And then, okay, so now I want to switch gears a little bit to look at the journey of your paper. So once you've submitted your paper for publication at a Lancet journal, what happens? So this provides you an essential outline um, of the peer review process and publication process, which you're all, of course, familiar with. Um, as many papers are rejected prior to peer review. The more competitive the journal, the more papers that will be rejected at this page, at this stage, um, or your paper can be selected to be sent for peer review. Um, at the Lancet Journal, peer review papers are always sent to three clinical referees and also statistical reviewers. We have a large panel, panel of statistical reviewers that we use, and we ensure that every original research article is seen by a statistician. So some papers are then rejected after peer review. Others are ultimately accepted, um, most often after going through a round of revision based on the reviewer's feedback. Um, but there's really more to these steps than meets the eye just by looking at a simple flowchart. So I want to give you just a little bit more um, insight into what happens specifically when you submit to Lancet Journal. So first of all, uh, every paper that's submitted is read and discussed by at least two editors, um, even those that don't get sent out for peer review. Um, if you've submitted your paper to the main Lancet, Many of these papers are read and discussed by editors of the appropriate specialty journals prior to peer review. Um, we not only discuss the specific scientific aspects of the study and clinical aspects, but also who might be appropriate to review the paper. Um, and I would like to say here that uh, part of our job as specialty journal editors is to act as advocates for our field of interest for the Lancet itself. Um, 
In other words, if, if there's a rheumatology study or trial that I feel is sufficiently high impact to be published in The Lancet, I will advocate for that paper to be accepted for publication in The Lancet. I have often had people approach me with the concern that the fact that The Lancet has launched a new specialty journal in rheumatology might mean that rheumatology papers will have less priority at The Lancet itself, um, but this really isn't the case. So papers that are peer-reviewed, once the peer review process is complete, the papers are discussed in an editorial meeting. Um, the Lancet group, I think, is quite unique um, in that we have editorial meetings twice a week that are attended by editors across all of the journals. So this means that editors with a whole variety of different expertise will have discussed your paper in detail. Um, and this is another opportunity for specialty editors to add valuable contextual insight to certain papers submitted to the Lancet. So this is all a very collaborative process. These are actually pictures taken during our editorial meetings. So these are um, people you see here are my colleagues here at the Lancet. So if your paper is ultimately accepted, um, typically, again, this is after a round of revision. Well, then congratulations are, of course, in order. Um, but there's also a long process that happens once papers are accepted. Again, many of you are going to be familiar with these processes. Um, but what I would say is that all of this for the Lancet journals happens in-house. So it's, again, very collaborative. Once papers are accepted, they're passed to our in-house team of assistant editors um, who copy edit your paper, um, production editors and illustrators, um, make sure that your um, display items look really great. Um, they redraw illustrations and graphs um, according to journal style. Um, and all of these parts of the process contribute um, to a very polished uh, end product. Just to show a few examples here. Um, so we really uh, adhere to the highest standards of quality um, and, of course, reporting when we're um, dealing with your paper even after acceptance. So inevitably, as mentioned, um, many papers are not accepted, um, and we do, in essence, reject more papers than we accept. Um, so if this is the outcome, where do you go next? So if you've submitted your paper to one of the Lancet journals or the Lancet itself, um, you still have many options at this stage that require very little or no additional effort on your part. Um, if your paper was rejected after review, um, it's also common that you there won't be any time required for additional peer review. I um, mean, of course, what I'm referring to here is our author transfer service to other journals in our portfolio. So um, just to give you an uh, example, so let's say you submitted a paper on juvenile idiopathic arthritis. You submitted it to The Lancet. Um, ultimately, The Lancet decided that the, the trial or study was not for them. Um, and depending on the editorial discussion, the editors might then decide um, that the trial is appropriate for one of the other specialty journals. And you'll be given the opportunity to transfer your paper. So if you have indeed conducted a trial on uh, juvenile idiopathic arthritis, you could potentially uh, trans be offered to transfer your papers to the Lancet Rheumatology. Equally, um, you would have the opportunity perhaps to submit to the Lancet Child and Adolescent Health. And you'll also be given the opportunity to transfer potentially to one of our Gold Open Access journals. Um, and I should also note that multiple transfers are possible. Um, so it's certainly uh, often not the end of the road if your paper is not accepted by the Lancet. And I also want to point out that authors are often given the choice of more than one destination journal. Uh, so for example, if you've conducted a study on HIV, you might be given the opportunity to uh, transfer that paper either to the Lancet Infectious Diseases or to the Lancet HIV. And really the goal of this transfer service is to find the best home for your work um, and to streamline the process and get your paper published as rapidly as possible without any undue delays. Of 
course, we recognize that um, you as authors have many options. Um, and so our aim is really to make the process as straightforward and easy as possible when you publish with us. Um, and this is just to point out that as part of this ongoing effort, we've recently launched a new section on thelancet.com um, to provide authors with a single source of information, forms, and all the details you need um, to assist you with the submission process to any of our journals. Um, the URL is shown here on the slide. And I would really encourage you to visit this page um, and even bookmark it. It's a great, uh, it's a great resource. Um, they're going to add new features to this soon. And you can also sign up here to receive uh, author newsletters that will be launching next year. So at this point, I'd like to switch gears a little bit <coughs> to talk in a little bit more detail about my journal, The Lancet Rheumatology, and also uh, to cover the three most uh, commonly asked questions that I get um, from authors who are thinking about submitting um, to a new relaunch journal. So this is the Lancet Rheumatology. We launched this year. The first issue was in September. Um, the journal is led by a London-based team of three editors, uh, myself, shown in the middle of the picture. We have Deputy Editor Anna Clark on the left and Senior Editor Helen Brooks on the right. Um, I won't go into any detail about us personally, but if you want to know more about our backgrounds and about the journal, you can certainly visit the Lancet Rheumatology website. Um, I think I will be showing that on the last slide. Um, you can click on the About button at the top of the web page and you'll see a little bit more detail about the editorial team and also our advisory board, which is shown here. We're really, really fortunate to be supported by a really outstanding and global advisory board. Um, we have 20 rheumatology specialists from a wide range of with a wide range of clinical expertise, um, and they represent 16 different countries worldwide. Um, one of the things that we're really committed to at the Lancet Group is diversity. Um, we've ensured that our board is gender balanced, um, which is also true for nearly all, the, all of the other Lancet titles. So in terms of our aim, uh, the aims and scope we have here at Lancet Rheumatology, um, this is actually just paraphrased from our aims and scope statement on our website. Um, so I won't go into that in a lot of detail. Um, but I will say is that uh, we have a focus on clinical research. We're a, a traditional clinical Lancet specialty journal. Um, with regard to the scope, um, we're eager to consider research across the entire spectrum of rheumatic, musculoskeletal, and connective tissue diseases. Um, the Lancet Rheumatology is fairly unique among specialty journals in the field. Um, we're a completely independent journal, not associated or affiliated with any society. Um, we have a real singular focus on clinical research, whereas most other specialty journals in the field publish across the entire spectrum of basic studies in animal models all the way to clinical trials. Um, we also encourage the mission of clinic proximal translational research um, at the Lancet Rheumatology. I'll go into that in a little bit more detail in a minute. Um, but essentially in terms of the uh, types of studies that we prioritize, this is essentially the same as I went over earlier in the talk. Um, but again, we also encourage the mission of, of translational research. Um, and given that translational research can mean different things to different people, I thought it might be instructive to talk in a little bit more detail um, about what we're looking for in a translational paper for the Lancet Rheumatology. Um, <clears throat> so a few guides to what we, we would really like to see in a translational research paper are studies that advance efforts towards precision medicine, uh, studies that investigate disease and clinical heterogeneity, and that inform clinical trial design. Um, for example, studies identifying and validating biomarkers of clinical outcomes or a therapeutic response to a new agent, and also studies that provide novel information on the pathophysiology of disease or the genetic basis of disease. Um, 
being mindful of the time, I just wanted to give you an example of a translational research paper that we published in the second issue of our journal, um, because I think this is an outstanding study. So I would encourage everyone to go and look at this paper if you want um, an example of, of a really outstanding translational research paper. Um, without going into too much detail, this paper uh, used the UK um, Shogun Syndrome database um, to create uh, a symptom-based stratification scheme. Um, and so they stratified patients according to a variety of different symptoms. And from there, compared clinical and biological differences in these patients, and then validated these patient groups in two independent cohorts. And what they went on to do in this particular paper was then to re-examine data from two different phase three trials according to these subgroups. And what you can see here, without going into details, um, in the blue line on the bottom panel, you can see that there is a significant difference um, within one of the subgroups between the drug being trialed and the placebo. Um, and so this is quite interesting from the standpoint of a potential way to design a trial going forward in Sjogren syndrome, um, where many, many trials have been negative, and insights um, into disease subgroups such as this could be very informative um, to future trial design. So I just wanted to show you that in a little bit of detail, but I would very much encourage you um, to go and look at that paper if you have the time. So lastly, um, I thought what would be very useful is to talk a little bit about um, the three, clearly the three top questions that I get as the editor of a newly launched journal. Um, I'm showing you here our two uh, brand new journals this year, The Lancet Digital Health and The Lancet Rheumatology. Um, so the three questions I get asked most frequently are when will the journal have an impact factor? Will Will my paper be indexed in PubMed, or is the journal's content indexed in PubMed? And how confident can I be that my paper will be seen? So firstly, um, just to address impact factor. So uh, inevitably, there's a wait for any new journal to get an impact factor. Um, and that is because of the way the impact factor is calculated. Um, so Clarivate is the name of the company um, that created the impact factor. Um, so the first step in getting an impact factor is applying to them to be indexed with them. Um, once they accept your journal for indexing, then they index your content back to the first issue, um, first volume. So the impact factor, um, I'm sure many of you are aware, but this is a measure of the frequency with which the average article is cited in a particular year. Um, and this is one way of measuring the importance or rank of the journal is by doing looking at the number of times its articles are cited. So for example, 20, the 2021 impact factor is calculated based on the equation shown here, with A being the number of times articles are cited in the year 2021. And this is citations to articles published in the preceding two years, 2019 and 2020. And that's then divided by the total number of citable items published. Um, citable items usually include uh, certainly research articles, full-length review articles. Um, this is something determined by Clarivate itself. Um, because of the way this is calculated and because of the Lancet Rheumatology and the digital, Lancet Digital Health started publishing in 2019, um, most likely the first impact factor we have will be 2021. Now that said, this is not something that's in any way under our control. This is entirely up to Clarivate when they decide to issue a journal, its first impact factor. Um, but that hopefully gives some idea of the time frame. Um, I can say that the Lancet Rheumatology um, and the Lancet Digital Health have both applied to Clarivate. And um, so now we're just in the, in the midst of the waiting process um, for the journal to be accepted and indexed. Um, one thing that I do like to um, illustrate with regard to impact factor is um, the trajectory of impact factors of Lancet specialty journals that preceded the new journals. I've chosen to show you here two of the specialty journals that launched in 2013, the Lancet Respiratory Medicine and the Lancet Diabetes and Endocrinology. 
Um, but I can tell you that a similar trend is um, seen for essentially all of the Lancet specialty titles. Uh, what you can see is that the first impact factor that these journals were issued um, in both cases was between 9 and 10. These are partial impact factors because um, one of the years of publication was not a complete year. Um, but as you can see, year on year, the impact factors tend to increase, um, with both of these journals having extremely impressive impact factors in 2018. Lancet Respiratory Medicine, 22.99, and the Lancet Diabetes and Endocrinology, 24.5. Um, so this is really a, a very strong trend amongst the Lancet specialty journals, and we really have no reason not to expect our new journals to have similar success. So the next question um, I get frequently is about PubMed indexing. So again, there's a process here um, of application. Um, PubMed requires that journals uh, must have published at least 40 peer review articles and have, must have been available for 12 months prior, prior to review. Now, this is for online-only journals, of which the Lancet Rheumatology is one. Um, once PubMed accepts your journal for indexing, then again, they index your content all the way back to the first volume, the first issue. Um, it's essentially a foregone conclusion that we will be indexed in PubMed, but again, it's a bit of a waiting game um, before your content appears. And so because of this, um, the third question is often asked, which is how can I be confident my paper will be seen? Well, we have a variety of mechanisms to maximize the visibility of all the content we publish. Um, one of those is uh, that all of our users can register to receive updates on the field of interest. Um, they can register for update alerts that coincide with conferences. And we also have um, a lot of other different ways um, to maximize the global reach and impact of your work, just a few of which are shown here. Um, we have online highlights, both on our website as well as the main Lancet.com. We can feature uh, papers published in specialty journals on the Lancet.com. We have multimedia offerings like video abstracts. Um, we have a whole bunch of multimedia, other multimedia that we um, often feature on social media. All of the journals have very active Twitter and Facebook accounts. Um, we're often covered in the news. Um, shown here is uh, one article that appeared in Bloomberg. Direct to your inbox. Again, there's all variety of um, updates and alerts that you can sign up to receive. And we also are very active at conferences. Again, we can time papers to uh, be published to coincide with conferences. Um, we often do conference updates where you can sign up and you can receive uh, related content related to the conference for free. Um, so all of these ways really help us uh, maximize the impact of the of studies published with us, even before we're indexed in PubMed and have an impact factor. So. Just to conclude, um, I just want to also point out um, that for all of our Lancet subscription-based journals, um, we have a mechanism now by which you can recommend our journals directly to your librarian. I'm showing the URL here. So if, um, if we have journals and content that you're interested in that your um, library does not subscribe to, you can suggest this directly to your library. Um, and I hope everyone will do that. Um, so, I believe we're essentially right on an hour at the moment, so um, I would very much like to turn to questions. Um, I have managed to have, get a chat screen stuck up on my screen, so I cannot actually see your questions at the moment, and I'm doing my best to get rid of that. Um, 